every metabolizable nutrient that enters your system has only one of two possible fates. It can either be stored away or it can be expended in some energy consuming reaction. Now, what most people have been led to believe relentlessly by know-it-alls is, again, the calorie theory has to be valid because of this thing called the first law of thermodynamics. And that's true. Metabolism and living things do, in fact, demonstrate the first law, which is conservation of energy. It basically says you can't get energy from nothing and energy can't disappear into a vacuum. The total energy in the universe is constant. Its form may change. And that's where the nuance comes in, is energy in the body, just like energy in any part of the universe, can be transformed. And basically, our job is to understand what the transformation variables are controlled by. So every macronutrient has this seesaw balance point. If you store more than you oxidize, then you will end up with more of that macronutrient. In the case of lipid or, or fat, we don't want that. We want more lean tissue. We don't want more fat tissue. So the goal really is in a global perspective of partitioning in your body is you want net fat oxidation and net protein storage. And how do you get that? Well, one of the ways to do it is to leverage, again, the issues that I talked about in energy expenditure or body composition and thermogenesis. And one of the most in-your-face convincing demonstrations to the nutritional mother goose crowd who maintains this calorie predominance to their death it is a recent study that was done at the, uh, actually the Bethesda facil facility in, in Maryland. And what they did was they wanted to demonstrate conclusively that this calorie nonsense needed to be discarded. So what they did was they took a group of weight stable, that is, their needle on their scale wasn't varying, non-pathologic individuals, so they didn't have diabetes or heart disease or any other confounding variable that might influence their ability to participate in the study. And they took three groups and they systematically gave them, over a six-month period of time, one of three supplements, which is listed up there. They gave them a carbohydrate, a whey protein, or a soy protein supplement. Now, this was not a diet study. These people were not told to restrict calories or to exercise differently than they had in their everyday average lives. They were told to take, go home and take two of these packets every day. I don't care when you take them, just take them. And it was very well controlled because they put you see the last ingredient there, paraminobenzoic acid, or PABA. The, each one of the three packets was laced with that, and these people would have to report every week to have their urine checked to show that they were actually consuming the supplements. So this was literally an overfeeding study. Okay, So for six months, these people got either packets of 52, 51, or 52 grams of carbohydrate or two different proteins. Now, they all have the so-called bomb calorimeter value of four kilocalories per gram, okay? So if you add up all the excess calories that these people would be taking over and above what their usual intake was, you come up with just a little over 64,000 excess calories. If you use the standard accepted conversion rates for energetic efficiency of a 60-40 fat to fat-free mass gained, then each one of these people should have gained around 18 pounds of weight. Well, in the next slide, you can see that nobody gained 18 pounds of weight. If you look at the top thing there, body mass, kilograms, okay? From baseline to completion at six months, the only group, the only group that gained any mass at all was, guess what? carbohydrate group. That's the only one of the three, despite overfeeding 64,000 calories over six months, the only group that even gained weight of any kind was the carbohydrate group. As you can see, the soy protein group pretty much stayed the same, and the body mass or weight 
of the whey protein group actually decreased. How's that for the calorie theory? The second slide shows you another astonishing factor, and that is the differential effect on partitioning. As you can see from the second slide in the middle, the whey protein group actually dissipated a significant amount of pure fat, despite being overfed energy, over and above what it maintained their needle, their scale needle at, they actually spontaneously dissipated body fat. The soy protein group did not. Then as a further measure of the regional specificity of the fat loss, they looked at waist circumference, which is traditionally regarded as a measure of abdominal fat, which has gotten a lot of buzz in the medical community because the pathologic implications of abdominal fat are worse than subcutaneous fat by several orders of magnitude. So they included this in their analysis. And as you can see, the largest statistical difference between the three groups was, in fact, the loss of abdominal fat. So here's one of the inconvenient truths up close and personal. You fed, overfed people 64,000 calories above what it, they were eating to maintain their weight on their bathroom scale. Only one group named, gained a trivial amount of weight. So what's that show? It shows that basically there are extant in the body compensation mechanisms, as you would expect there would be because wild animals don't vary their weight much at all, and they have no way of knowing how much dietary energy they're taking in. So the pure facts of nature are that compensation mechanisms exist that are very powerful in overcoming any tendency to accumulate undue amounts of fat. Why would that be beneficial? Well, predation. Animals that are fat and slow tend to get caught <laughs> by their predators. So being a fat slob in nature is not good for your overall longevity and not good for the species propagation. So there are protective mechanisms in every mammal, certainly, that are powerful mitigators of the accumulation of untoward body fat. And that's an important fact to understand. Every single one of you has that regulatory capability of resisting fat gain. What we've done as a modern culture is to essentially compromise that regulatory mechanism. And I'm going to show you how to get rid of that unbalance at the end of the talk. So here you have evidence of supercompensation of excess energy with a selective loss of abdominal body fat in a whey protein group. You'll notice that the soy protein group, which was fed at the exact same dietary level of intake, didn't do these things. So here again is a dramatic demonstration that the kind of protein makes a difference. So, next slide. Some people took a look at this and said, well, we don't believe it. Because it's just not, you know, consistent with what we've, you know, preached as our cognitive dissonance for the last hundred years, so it has to be bullshit. So they went out to make sure that it was bullshit and published the result, and unfortunately, their results were stronger than the first. What this group is, is a group of weight-stable adults who are essentially fed a simple supplement, either a carbohydrate and fat supplement, or a milk protein supplement that had a bit of carbohydrate in it. And this study was designed to take weight-stable people and give them two millijoules, which is approximately 500 calories. They said, we're going to take two millijoules of, of energy out of your diet, and we're going to replace it with either this protein supplement or this carbohydrate fat supplement. And they did that over the course of a long time. And what did they observe? Well. They observed significant reductions in fat-free mass, I mean, excuse me, in fat mass and percent body fat, accumulation of new fat-free mass, which is um, lean tissue, mostly skeletal muscle, and basically what this demonstrated was that the first study we showed where you use protein as a vehicle and this was not overfeeding, this was isocaloric substitution. So again, 
you have the demonstration that in the absence of weight loss, you have a substantive change in body composition simply by adding milk protein to the diet. If you had done this with soy protein, this would not be evident. So once again, the milk protein's contribution to a positive effect on the body fat regulatory loop is in evidence without weight loss. Now, what does that mean for the equation that we were talking about? Well, one of the things that it means is that it basically confirms the importance of looking at energy expenditure variables in terms of body composition. Because these people all increase their fat-free mass. And this is without exercise, okay? This is simply dietary substitution of a protein supplement that I had, I think it had something in the order of 52 grams or 53 grams of, of milk protein per day. Now, the next slide gives you some insight into how this occurred. First of all, we see substantial increases in all the variables that relate to energy expenditure that are meaningful, especially dietary-induced thermogenesis. You see the adequate, the AP there is adequate protein, and the high protein was the group that received the simple supplement. Again, this is in the absence of any weight loss strategy. This is in the absence of any exercise activity added into their daily routine. This is the result of simply feeding these people a 52 gram supplement of dairy protein over a protracted period of time. And as you can see, the results that we saw in terms of body composition are explained by the fact that they had increases in thermogenesis, increases in total 24-hour energy expenditure, and more importantly, that 24-hour RQ, that represents respiratory quotient, a, ma a mathematical quantitative estimate of the percent energy being burned as fat. A low RQ is indicative of a person oxidizing fat. So the results of the body composition were underwritten by these impressive and very, very powerful metabolic regulatory alterations. Okay, next slide. One of the ways that you could look at this is from the standpoint of what I call a nutritional ecology paradigm. One of the most interesting things that has been completely overlooked in a discussion of the importance of optimizing protein in the diet is a well-established principle that comes from exhaustive, highly detailed studies of both animals and humans looking at what's called protein leveraging. And protein leveraging refers to the phenomenon that many mammalian species and some non-mammalian species have been studied as well actually set as one of their primary nutritional goals existing in the wild is to set a protein intake target as a threshold. Why would that be? Well, in terms of you know, the development of organisms, especially complex organisms, the primary nutritional strategies, the big three, are to one, get enough energy, two, get enough protein because protein underwrites everything in the body, and number three is to avoid things that are poisonous. Those are really the big you know, three strategy. Number two is extremely important for a secondary reason, and that is when you are developing in the circumpolar regions of, say, like the Arctic, you're not going to get many carbohydrate-based foods available, made available to you, and you still got the glucose problem that I talked about. So what's the backstop for glucose when you can't eat it and you can't eat things that turn into it? Well. The backstop is pure and simple dietary protein. In fact, most of the dietary protein that you ingest on a 24-hour basis is shuttled off into that protein or the glucose synthesis factory called gluconeogenesis. And in essence, when you correlate dietary intake of protein with gluconeogenesis rates, you fact and find in fact that, that happens. They both go up. What goes up with them is the energy expenditure of the organism. And that, this is free energy spin to you. It's just you're dissipating energy at a very, very rapid rate. What does that correlate with? Well, in humans, it correlates with profound satiety. So if you increase dietary protein incrementally to very high levels, 
you'll find yourself having difficulty keeping up because you won't have any drive to eat. Your appetite will essentially be zero. And one of the underwriters of that is how much new glucose is being made at very high cost, very, very inefficient energetic efficiency by amino acids from your dietary protein. So in essence, if it's true that if you leave an animal to its own devices to seek out food in its natural environment, that they're going to eat at a level that has a protein target built into them, and there's abundant evidence that that is true, then you have the opportunity to realize what the implementation of the Western diet has done. The Western diet has selectively depleted which macronutrient? Protein. Why? Mostly economic reasons. Because cheap crap corn-derived food products, which are subsidized by the U.S. government, don't cost nearly as much as high-quality protein foods. So for the past several decades, the percent protein as metabolizable energy in the Western diet has been stuck at 12 to 15 percent. It's impossible to know what the Paleolithic ancestors of 50,000 years ago ate as a percent energy because they evolved at different latitudes. Obviously, a Greenland Eskimo who was eating fat and protein had a much higher protein intake than, than a, a human developing at the equator where there was abundant plant life. But most of the retrodictions that have been done on primitive hunter-gatherers who live off the land today suggest that the range was between 30 and 40 percent protein. So if that's true, then we have cut our, our habitual protein intake or our target protein intake by at least half. Now, the protein Leverage theory would say that when you do that to an animal that has this machinery, this wiring, what do they do? They start to overconsume energy to try and get to that target level. Is this true or is it just bullshit? Here's the next slide. <clears throat> this is a result of a study in which that, this was specifically done. And got some people and incarcerated them in a metabolic ward for a couple of weeks. And what they did was they made up foods that were really well disguised in terms of their macronutrient composition. Mm -hmm. And for the period of, of confinement, what they did to these people was they gave them a diet that was 5% protein energy, 5%. And then they let them out after that period of low protein and they saw, they recorded specifically what they would eat for the three days after the 5% protein diet was eliminated. And the theory was, of course, if this protein leverage thing is true, then when these people have the ability to self-select foods that are disguised with everything except their taste and their smell, that they would naturally select higher protein foods. And in fact, that's what happened. They were given meals in the institutional environment, so that's meal, and then they were given meals that were prepackaged, and they were instructed to take them home and eat them and record what they ate, what their selections were. And what you can see in the open uh, rectangles are the people who are exposed to the, high, the, the low protein 5% diet and the other people who are exposed to the usual and customary 15% over the same, under the same conditions. And you can see for at least three days, the people exposed to the low protein date naturally selected high protein foods by presumably subconscious mechanisms because they had no way of telling what the foods were made of. They were specifically engineered to disguise that. So here's, an, here's evidence from a recent study done by a very sophisticated lab in France that suggests that humans do have the innate wiring for protein leveraging and adds credence to the theory that one of the consequences of diluting the American diet with carbohydrate foodstuffs at the expense of protein has been a deliberate overconsumption of energy. Next slide. This is manifest in two ways. And these, on the left is an animal rodent study and on the right, a group of human studies. And it goes back to our V for victory. What this basically shows as a function of metabolizable energy, percent protein, the amount of thermogenesis or heat that's generated and the amount of the energetic cost of weight gain. What this really means is that once you're past that nadir at about 20% in rodents and about 12% in humans, 
where the animal's protein threshold is apparently targeted, if you feed them additional protein over and above that, as opposed to carbohydrate or fat, their energy expenditure goes through the roof. And as we saw in the previous slide with the human study, most of that energy expenditure is dissipating fat. So here's a rationale to suggest to everybody who's interested in oxidizing fat at a maximal rate to take that 12% metabolizable energy as protein and jack it up three times. That would be my recommendation, is to get it to 30, 35, 40% of everything you put in your mouth as protein. Next slide. 